this morning is a brief one, but it is a very um, concentrated one and has some things that I think will be very encouraging to us. And again, in order to see the encouragement, in order to see how bright the light is of God's grace and mercy, we do need to see the darkness as well. We need to see what our circumstances were, where we were at apart from the grace of God. And I believe that this text gives us all these things. So just um, a few verses from Romans chapter 5. I'd like to read verses 6 through 10. Paul writes, By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, I think we're going to focus mainly on that last verse, but we'll, we'll draw elements from, from each of these. But may the Lord bless his word to our understanding and to our growth in grace this morning. Now, again, this is Easter Sunday, you know, and uh, on Easter, our minds are basically irresistibly drawn to that defining event in God's plan to save us, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, His being raised again to life on the third day after He had been so cruelly put to death on the cross. And our minds are drawn to it because this event, this is the event that assures us that our guilt, the crimes that we have committed against God, and we are all guilty, our breaking of His holy law for which we would have been punished forever, that our guilt has been taken away once and for all. This was the Father's public declaration that the sins Jesus carried for us, our sins that put Him in the grave, were paid for in full when He died on the cross. Remember, if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that our faith would be worthless and those who have died in Christ would have perished and we would be of all men most miserable that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and that is the proof that His payment was accepted, that it was sufficient and that we are safe. Now, the Lord wants us to reflect upon that resurrection he wants us to, so much to do this, to remember His love in providing it that, that He gives us this day. And let me just mention this, He gives us more than one day, more than one resurrection day per year. I always have to say this. He actually gives us 52 days, 52 days to remember the resurrection, 52 Lord's days, 52 Sundays. And they are meant to remind us of His love and His mercy to fill our hearts with joy and with thankfulness so that we can't help but gather together and to worship Him. You know, we have a double blessing on the Lord's Day, don't we? we? We can remember the Lord's death and we can remember His resurrection. And this is really the way the Lord wants us to do it. He doesn't want us to do it once a year at Christmas and at Easter. He wants us to do it every Lord's Day through the Lord's Supper and through the Lord's Day. The two things in Scripture, and the only two things that are modified by this particular um, adjective, Lord's, that which belongs to Him. He owns these things in particular because they are the symbols of those two most important things by which we were saved, His death and His resurrection. Well, that's what we want to think about this morning, is the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we want to look at it from the perspective of God's love. Okay? The infinite love that God has shown to us in giving us His Son to lay down His life and then raising Him again in order that we might be saved. Now, as I said before, to understand how great this love is, we need to remember, first of all, how undeserving we are. Now, Paul uses three words, actually he uses four words in our passage that do a 
a good job of describing what we were apart from God's grace. We were His enemies. We were sinners. We were ungodly. We were helpless. Okay? Basically, we were at war with God. Okay? We were His enemies. Now, sometimes we don't realize this, but it's not just that we were haters of God and at war with Him. God was also our enemy. Now, it may have seemed as though He loved us, and uh, most people believe that, that God does love us. And let me just mention, I, have to, I do have to say, say something here. God does love us, but not with the kind of love that most people think. And I'm talking here about unbelievers, okay? God does not find unbelievers attractive because there's nothing in them that is attractive. You know, the, the, the image of God by which they were made beautiful to originally has been wiped out by the fall. It's been erased. But that doesn't mean that God is not loving, that God is not benevolent. He is. He's still benevolent and kind. Uh, Jesus Himself says in Luke 6, verse 35, speaking about His Father, He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. But we need to understand that that is because of God's goodness, because of, of his, his fullness, as it were, of, of mercy and grace that He gives to everyone everything they enjoy. But that isn't affection, okay? That is not affection for unbelievers. Jesus tells us that we are to love our enemies, not that we find anything attractive in them, but we are to love them even as our Father loves His enemies. See, the reason I bring that up is because sometimes we think that love means that God is not alienated from us, that He is not at war with us, but as a matter of fact, He is because at the end of the day, if His enemies don't repent, they're going to stand before Him as a judge and He is going to condemn them forever. Now, we, of course, were also God's enemies, weren't we? Again, we may not have thought that we were, we may not have thought that we had anything against Him. We may have even felt some affection towards Him for all the good things that He has shown us. See, His goodness and His kindness and His benevolence, which is meant to lead us to repentance, can sometimes confuse us and make us think that God actually approves of us. And it was just recently I heard somebody who does not believe in the Lord uh, who prayed to God and he saw, he saw an answer to that prayer and his conclusion was God must accept him because he answered his prayer. Well, that's simply God's goodness. God is good. He is good to everyone and that is meant to lead him to repentance. But the Bible says that if he does not believe in the true God and accept the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him and turn from his sins and follow him, that he won't be saved. We mustn't confuse that with the fact that we are His enemies, and even when we receive that kindness and think that we're, you know, disposed toward the Lord, that doesn't mean that we are not His enemies. We did not love Him. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we hated God. That's, that was our condition when we came into this world before the grace of God. Think about what Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 7, and let me just mention that what he writes here was true of every single one of us before God had mercy on us. It says this, the mind set on the flesh, and that's true of everyone who doesn't have the Spirit, is hostile toward God. Hostile. Hates God. Now, how do we know that's true? Well, Paul continues. He says this, because it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They cannot because they will not. So the reason why we know that we actually were hostile toward God is the fact that we refuse to obey Him, okay? I mean, again, ask yourself these questions. Before God had mercy on you through the Lord Jesus Christ, was He the first in your life? Did you live only to please Him? Did you keep the promises that you made Him? Did you spend His day with Him every single week, that day of the resurrection, that first day of the week, today? Did you honor the authority that He put in this world, your parents, your elders, the secular governors? Did you care about other people the way you care about yourself? 
Did you keep yourself and others morally pure in the things that you did, in the way that you talked, in the things that you even wore? Did you take anything ever that did not belong to you? Did you say anything that was either true or untrue in order to hurt other people? And did you ever want something that somebody else had that didn't belong to you? Well, you know as well as I do that we didn't keep those commandments, certainly not all the time. And the reason why we didn't is because we didn't want to, because we didn't love Him. It's because we actually hated Him. And of course, we also know this, if we know ourselves very well, that if we kept any of these commandments apart from the grace of God, we only did it to benefit ourselves, to get something we wanted. We didn't do it for Him. Now, if obeying God's law from the heart is the definition of love, which it is, Jesus tells us in, in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You know, Paul says that basically love is the summary of the law of God. If that is true, then not to keep the law, not to obey the law from the heart is the very definition of what it means to hate God. Okay, we were His enemies. And the reason why we were His enemies, as Paul tells us here, is because we were sinners. We were ungodly. We were evil. That's how we came into this world. You know, when David wrote this in Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. He wasn't saying his mother was an immoral person. He was saying that he was conceived and brought forth in sin. He did not mean that he was unique among all the human race, that this only happened to him. He was saying that this was true of all of us. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, there is none who does good, not even one. Uh, all have gone astray. All have, you know, basically forsaken the Lord. And that's why Paul tells us that we were helpless. You know, we had, were haters of God, had rebelled against Him, broken His law. This guilt made us, of course, guilty, sinful. We would have been pressed down into hell forever. And there wasn't a thing we could do about this situation ourselves. As a matter of fact, we didn't want to do anything about it because we didn't love God. We were trying to get away from God. Remember what Paul says? God reveals Himself in the creation every day. The creation is pouring out speech about God, but what is it that people do with that speech? They suppress it. They try to put it out of their thinking so that they can live the way they want to live. Well, it's not a pretty picture. Okay, but that is how the Bible represents us. And like most people, as I said before, we may have thought before the grace of God that we are on our way to heaven, that we are on the road to heaven. Most people think they are, not realizing that the path we were on actually is the broad road and that hell was actually in front of us at every moment, opening its mouth, waiting to swallow us alive. Okay, that was our situation. Now, that's the bad news. But there is good news. Paul goes on to tell us that while we were helpless, while we were sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were still God's enemies, that God sent His Son to reconcile us to Him through His death. Now, if the Father had done nothing, we eventually would have faced Him as our judge, the Father, and He would have justly condemned us to hell forever because God is a just God who cannot overlook sin, cannot leave sin unpunished. But again, here is the good news. Because of His infinite love, because of His limitless love, He didn't give us what we deserve. Instead, He gave us His Son. Jesus, He sent into the world in order to save us. John 3, 17, okay? We often quote John 3, 16, and I will before the sermon's over. But this is what Jesus says in John 3, 17. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Jesus came into this world to do everything that was necessary in order to save us from certain destruction. Now, you know, sometimes we do get a little bit confused when we think about the justice of God, and we think about the love of Christ, and sometimes it almost appears as though they're pitted against one another. That since God is the one who was threatening judgment, 
and that Jesus was the one who came to save us, that it was Jesus who loved us and not the Father. Well, we know that isn't the case. It was the Father who loved us and sent His Son to save us. And here's where John 3.16 comes in. For God so loved the world, and again, the world in the sense of this fallen, evil world, and think again of enemies, sinners, ungodly. Uh, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So while we were His enemies, while we were still basically bound in bitterness and hatred against Him, He gave the one who was most precious to Him to save us from hell. And remember what hell is. Hell is God's just judgment against our sins. He saved us from His judgment, from, again, His justice. Now, we know that God is just. We know that God is holy. We know that He will punish the wicked. We hear about that a lot, at least we, we, maybe not as much as we used to. But it's true. But God also is infinite love. And out of that love, He sent His Son. Now, Jesus, of course, also loved us and willingly came to save us. Paul tells us in Philippians 2 that He is God, okay, that He is God the Son, and there are three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this is the eternal second person of the triune God, that He emptied Himself by becoming one with us, by taking our nature to Himself, and then He humbled Himself to become obedient to His Father to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because Jesus loved us, He was willing to do what was necessary to give us eternal life. And there were basically two things that He had to do. He had to obey His Father's law. Now, Jesus obeyed this law because He wanted to obey it, because the law is the very definition of what is good and what is right and what is loving, and that is what Jesus desires. That's what He loves, and so that's what He does. Second, he kept this law because he loves his father. He knew the law showed him how to love him. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples on one occasion when they brought food to him and said, Master, eat. And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. There was nothing that pleased Jesus more than basically serving and pleasing His Father. Now, that's important because the thing that God does in redemption when He saves us is He works that same image in us. So when we think about what Jesus experienced, these are the things we should be experiencing as Christians. Third, He kept the law because He had to be perfect in order to qualify as our sin bearer. If He had broken the law, then He would deserve basically to perish in hell. And he would not have been able to take our place, which is unthinkable. But he also obeyed this law because he loved us. He knew that if you and I could not meet the standard, God's holy law, that his Father would never accept us. And so he kept it in our place. Again, this is something that we think of the vicarious atonement of Christ on the cross, that he died in our place, and he did. But He also took our place in our obedience because we could not obey. He obeyed for us. But now that's the first thing. The second thing is He must also lay down His life for us. Paul tells us the wages of sin is death. Jesus knew that if He was to save us, He had to give up His own life as a ransom for our lives. Jesus said to His disciples on one occasion that this was the love that He had. For them, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. He goes on to say, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And of course, by the Holy Spirit, that's what they were doing. So Jesus loved us and he laid down his life for us. And that is the greatest expression of love. And so we see in the Gospels that when it came time for Jesus to lay down his life, he set his face towards Jerusalem. And nothing would dissuade him from going there, and he knew it was going to happen to him there. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be condemned. He was going to be mocked and beaten, spit upon. 
And after his enemies had done all they could against him to show their uttermost contempt, he was going to be nailed to a cross. And there he endured his Father's justice, his wrath against our sins. Jesus literally went through hell on the cross. He completed that redemption on the cross. Remember when he says, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He said to the thief on the cross, you'll be with me in paradise. He was talking about heaven. Jesus didn't go to hell after he died on the cross. He experienced hell on the cross, and then he went to be with his Father in, in heaven. But he did all these things, went through all these things, would not be dissuaded from going through all these things because we are his friends, because he is our friend, because in that friendship he loved us. Now again, I just want to remind us that we really need to put ourselves in Jesus' place and imagine what he went through, remembering that he was fully man and it, that he wasn't immune to pain, that he felt the mocking, that he felt the rejection, that he felt the scorn, he felt every blow of the whip, every strike of the hammer on the nails, the anguish of separation from his father, and every stroke of divine justice. Jesus felt all of that. That's what made him sweat blood in the garden before he goes into that time of suffering. But he willingly endured all of this in our place because he loves us. Now, finally, Paul tells us that having reconciled us, the Father having reconciled us through Jesus' death, Paul says that he will bring us to heaven through his life. And this, of course, is talking about the resurrection. He says in verse 10, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, the fact that he ever lives to make intercession for us. Now, we know the story did not end at the cross. Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. Jesus was seen by over 500 witnesses at one time alive. Now, this, again, was the, the Father's vindication that he had received the, the payment that Jesus made. But this also proves not only that Jesus is who he said he was, but that he did what he said he came into the world to do, and that is to save us. Now, he spent another 40 days with his disciples, and then he ascended into heaven. He sat down at the right hand of the Father, uh, both until his enemies are subdued under his feet, and also to intercede and to pray for us. Now, his reigning on the throne gives us the confidence that we can be witnesses in a hostile world and that the Lord is going to keep us safe. Also, that He will eventually bring us to heaven. But that is connected with His prayers, His intercession, where He prays to keep us in the grace of basically His grace and His mercy so that we will not fall away, but we will eventually make it. Now, again, I just wanted to point out that this, again, shows us how much God loves us that He doesn't give us what we deserve, but He gives us grace. He gives us His Son to die for us. He gives us His Son to live for us. He gives us this mediator. This is how much He loves us. This is how much Jesus loves us, that He was willing to lay down His life for us and to be raised again from the dead forever to, to intercede for us and to pray for us to make sure that we eventually arrive in heaven. And I think that the Bible also clearly tells us that as a husband looks forward to being united with his bride, so our Lord Jesus Christ looks forward to receiving us as his bride in heaven. This is the, the love the Father and the Son have for us. This is the love they have for everyone who puts their trust in him and shows that, that they do trust him and that they do love him by turning from their sins and obeying His commandments from the heart. Remember, how is it that we know that, that our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ goes beyond simply believing what God says in His Word? Because it does have to go beyond that. That's the first step. 
Well, we know it because Jesus is being formed in us, because we have the same love, because we have the same spirit that Jesus had. And so we are doing the same things Jesus did. We love the law and we want to keep it, not perfectly, sadly. There's still other things we want to do that aren't lawful, that are, you know, offenses to God. I'm reminded again of what R.C. Sproul said on one occasion, and um, it's rather strong, rather strong statement, but he, he said, love God, sometimes I hate God. Now, have we ever thought that? If we haven't felt that way, whenever we choose to sin, that's exactly what we're doing. Love, we're not loving God, we're actually hating God, and we need to think about that. We, would, we wish that we had a perfect and pure and holy love, but we don't. It's mingled with sin, but we still have that love, and we want to obey, and we want to turn and put those sins to death, and that is, a matter of fact, what we will be doing if we belong to the Lord. We will be putting off the old man, putting it to death, and we will be putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and seeking to live in every way that is pleasing to Him. Now, if that's true of us this morning, then all this love that we've been talking about is directed toward us. We know that He loves us with more than just a love of benevolence. The Bible says that when we are in the Lord Jesus Christ and He is being formed in us, that there actually is now something that is lovely in us, something that draws out the affections of the Father. He sees the Son in us, and He loves the Son. He sees us in the Son. And so we are loved by Him with a whole heart and a true affection, not just kindness, but now He loves us because of what He sees in us and, and the one He sees us, of course, in. So if, that, if that's true of us, then He really does love us and we, of course, need to thank Him and praise Him and worship Him for His mercies. But let me just close by saying that if that is not true of you or anyone who might be listening to the stream or perhaps the, uh, the tape in the future watching the video, if it isn't true of you, then you need to look to Him for that mercy, to change your heart, to give you that grace that you might embrace Him, realizing that the Lord is gracious and merciful and He says He will never turn away anyone who comes to Him in faith. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard and help us to be thankful. Help us also to search our hearts because in a moment we're going to come to the Lord's table, which is a reminder again of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as we come and participate in this, we're reminded from 1 Corinthians 11 that we do need to come believing, we need to come repenting, we need to come renewing our covenant with the Lord to love Him and to follow Him all our days. Let, let's bow in a moment of prayer, in silent prayer, and then I'll, I'll close that time in preparation.